1985, at the age of eight, I was on the front page of a major Melbourne newspaper. Not because of anything special that I'd done, but because my brother was doing something that many other kids before him hadn't. He was one of the first kids with Down syndrome to be integrated into a regular primary school in Victoria. One of the first kids with Down syndrome to have access to the same education as all other kids in the state. You see, because although access to education had been defined as a human right way back in 1952, the rights of kids with disabilities to have the same access took much longer. Of course, we had no idea about this as kids. We were just going to school like everyone else. But my mum and dad had been advocating for Dan to go to a regular school for many, many years before that day. And like any big practice or policy change, this wasn't an individual fight. It took a movement of people to change the way the community thought about the rights of kids like Dan. So at the same time as my mum and dad were approaching schools to enrol Dan, there were people in government, in community, in education, all advocating for change. And that was way before we ever stood in front of a camera. Fast forward 35 years, and you can see kids with Down syndrome in schools all over the country. And as adults, you can see people with Down syndrome as critics, art critics, on national TV shows, working as international models, and even performing at TEDx. You see, access to education, the ability to read and write and create, it provides opportunities for people to engage with the world around them, to make decisions for themselves, and to live their best lives. That's why it's a human right. But we don't go to school just to learn to read and write. We go to school to make friends and to learn how to connect with people who are similar and different to us. Growing up with Dan as my brother, I found out pretty quickly how people who are different are treated. The good and the bad. And as I grew, so did my sense of how important it is to value difference. The rights of people to have the same access to opportunities, no matter their ethnicity, their ability, their age, their gender, their sexuality, or how much money they make, that's a core belief for me. It's part of who I am. I've always been focused on making the world I live in a kinder, fairer, and more connected place. And today, many connections are built and maintained using digital platforms. In fact, access to digital technology today is key to how we engage with the world and how we connect to each other. But just like there were kids with Down syndrome missing out on school 35 years ago, there are people missing out on digital technology today. Can you imagine what it would be like not to be online at all? Not to have access to or the ability to use the internet or digital technology? Now, I am not an early adopter, and I'm a Gen Xer, so I am definitely not a digital native. We still had phones you had to dial and drag into the hallway on a long cord for a private conversation when I was a teenager. But today, even I have a work mobile phone, a personal mobile phone, a laptop at work, a laptop at home, an iPad, an Apple TV, and despite saying I would never have one, I now have a Kindle. <laughs> I work online, I book things online, I talk to my friends and family online, I bank online, I read the news online, and yes, I do pay for a subscription. I connect with government services online. I'm political online. I share my views, I tweet politicians, I sign petitions. I have Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, WhatsApp, Slack, Messenger, just to name a few. I wrote the first draft of this talk on my phone, sitting on a plane. The important thing to remember is that because I'm educated, because I have a well-paying job, because I've had to learn how to use digital technology for my work, I have a choice about how much I engage online. And like me, many Australians are digitally very connected. 
The proportion of households with the internet on at home is, has steadily increased since 2004, and now it's at 86%, and that's only likely to increase. In fact, Australia's digitally empowered consumers spend 6.8 hours a day online. So for most of us, we're thinking about how to ma make sure that we're spending time offline as well as online. That we, you know, balance and make sure we focus on um, connecting with each other face to face and with nature, as well as through a screen. But there is another Australian story. There are currently two and a half million Australians who are not online. That's 10% of our total population that don't access the internet or use digital technology. That's more than the population of Brisbane or Perth. Now, I hear what you might be thinking. Maybe that's a choice people have made. Maybe it's good to not be so dependent on technology. But for most of these people, this is not a choice that they've made. You see, to have a choice about how much you engage online, you first need to have access. There are some families in remote parts of our country that drive four hours to get to the closest internet connection so their kids can do their schoolwork. You also have to be able to afford it, because although digital technology is everywhere, it's not cheap. So if you're on Newstart at $272 a week, once you've paid rent and bought some food, there's not much money left for anything else, let alone an internet or phone bill. You also have to have the ability to use it, because like any skill, you need to learn it. So, if you've never been taught or had the opportunity to engage with digital technology in your day-to-day -day life, then it can seem baffling and even a little scary. So if you have access, you can afford it, and you have the ability to use it, then you have the opportunity to decide how much you engage online. You're digitally included. But digital inclusion is not just about computers and the internet. It is definitely not about whether you use Facebook or Netflix or whether you prefer Apple or Android. Digital inclusion is about how you use digital and online technologies to improve your life. You use it to further your education. You use it to apply for a job. You use it to better understand and manage your health. You use it to book appointments, tickets, accommodation. You use it to connect with others. You use it to interact with government and essential services. You use it to get yourself around the city, around the country, or around the world. Not being able to use digital technology today is like not being able to read and write. It creates barriers to how you engage in the world. And with the significant role that online technology plays today, the internet is not a luxury. It's a necessity. Now, I want you to think, I, I challenge you to think about ways that you engage in the world of work and life today that doesn't include digital technology. The rights of people to have access, the, the, it, it's significant way that in technology is engaged in our world today, the access to it and the rights, the access to it and the ability to use it is becoming a human right. I want you to imagine for a minute that you are 50 years old and you live in a regional rural Queensland town. You left school at 15 to go and work in the mines and the mine that you've been working out for 35 years it's just closed down. So you've been made redundant. Now, there are jobs around, but they're being taken by people who are much, much younger than you. And so for the very first time in your life, you step foot into a Centrelink office. And they tell you, you need to register on MyGov. That's MyGov. <laughs> To be paid by the government, you have to apply for 20 jobs a fortnight. 
oh, it's easy, they say. All you have to do is look up the jobs that meet your skills online and send them your CV by email. But you don't have an email address. In fact, you never used a computer. What do you do? Now, I still believe that being online should be a choice. If people choose not to be online, there should be other ways of engaging with government and essential services. But the reality is, supporting people in our country to make that a real choice is essential in our world. Unless we do something to support those two and a half million people to make that a choice and to be engaged in the digital world, the digital divide, and therefore our social divide, will only get deeper and wider. So, what do we do to support those two and a half million people to engage in the world? Well, we build a movement. We build a movement of people and organisations who are all focused on supporting people to learn digital skills and to engage in the online world. Organisations like the Turkish Hampton Seniors Group, who are supporting each other to learn how to Skype and use WhatsApp and FaceTime so that they can engage with people who are uh, their family and friends who they've lost contact with. People like Wurrabindi Youth Centre, who are supporting their older, their older people, their elders and their young people to create art online and then share it with the world. Like Bankstown Aged Care, who are using Google Home to help people with dementia find music that makes them dance. Like the Langwarren Men's Shed, where a man can go and have a chat and have a cuppa and, and do some woodwork, but now also learn how to email and stay in touch. You see, the people who are missing out on the world today who are not online, they're also the people who are socially excluded in our world. They're the people who are, who are older, they're poorer, they are more likely to be indigenous, they are less likely to be, have long-term employment, more likely to have a disability, and less like, are more likely to, have, um, to be dependent on government services to survive. But I want to tell you now another story about my brother Dan. In 2017, my partner and I decided that, that, work, that life was too short to focus on work alone, and so we were lucky enough to scrape together enough money to take off and travel the world. Because of the digital technology available to us, we uh, were able to stay in daily contact with Dan using WhatsApp. Every morning I would wake up, no matter where we were in the world, and there would be a message from Dan saying, where are you today? Please send photo or video. So, like a good little sister, I sent photos of the places we were, the views we saw, and the people we met. <laughs> you see, Dan's not really, uh, he's got some health issues and he doesn't really like long plane trips, so he's not likely to go on a trip like that. But because of the digital technology, it felt like he was with us. I had no idea what sending his, him these images would lead to. You see, Dan is an artist. He's been painting since he was a teenager. And when we returned from our trip, he had a surprise for us. He had been painting all of the destinations we had sent him on WhatsApp. <laughs> so the digital technology kept us connected. But because of that, he was able to create his own unique journey, vision of our journey. In 2018, we walked into a gallery full of Dan's artworks of our journey. Not only that, but family and friends flew in from all over the country 
to Toowoomba in Queensland to be at the opening of the exhibition. So the digital technology kept us connected. But the end result was human creativity and face-to-face -face connection. And yet again, because Dan is amazing, we made the front page of the paper. For Dan, he's using technology to live his best life, despite the fact that people with disabilities are often digitally excluded. He uses his smartphone to stay in touch and to check the footy scores and the weather. He uses a computer to manage our family and friends' footy tipping competition. He uses an Excel spreadsheet and he sends us emails if we've forgotten to put our footy tips in on time. And with a little help from a web developer, he has recently launched his artist website. So, Dan's not being left behind. He's using technology to stay connected to the people he loves and to spur on his creativity. He's digitally included. And that is a right that everyone in our country should have the right to.